Hello and welcome. I'm making a series on the history of religious ideas, and today I begin with the magnum opus of E. J. Michael Witzel. He is a retired Harvard professor who wrote The Origin of the World's Mythologies. Now, before reading this book, I used to think of mythology as a bunch of weird stories unique to the ancient cultures they came from, like Greece or Rome. I knew that there were some parallels between different myths like Noah and Gilgamesh, but never that all these myths could be peeled back to uncover a single archaic mythological system. And this is exactly what Witzel is proposing, that among all the various myths, there's a common ancestor to them that originated in the remote past. He does this by analyzing the world's mythologies from a comparative and historical perspective. He then connects the many parallels to reconstruct an original mythology that united humanity from Greece to the Maya of South America. Now, uncovering this original mythology is vital because myth is the expression of religious ideas in a lyrical way. And so uncovering the oldest myths uncovers the purest and most authentic beliefs of humanity. In his 20-year research into the subject, Witzel identified two main mythological systems, and he named them after the dual supercontinents Gondwana and Laurasia. So we'll briefly go over these now. Gondwanan is the older of the two. Witzel dates this to some 70,000 years ago. Okay, now I know that dating just sounds unbelievable, that we can even date anything this far back. I will go into a little bit later how he comes to these dates, but just to continue with a brief narrative here. Gondwanan was the mythological system that was carried by Homo sapien sapien as we left Africa and hugged the coast eastwards all the way into Australia. This system is a collection of myths and is characterized by no preoccupation with the creation of the universe. In other words, in Gondwanan mythology, the universe simply exists. Okay, we simply live. There is really no concern about a beginning nor about an end. And this mythological system carries certain very archaic beliefs, um, particularly the concept of a high god, albeit a deus odiosus, which means an idol, divine being, not very concerned with humanity, but nonetheless a figure that is well known. Now, Witzel uses this mythological system more as a countercheck to Laurasian mythology, which is his main focus. Laurasian mythology is humanity's first novel. It's a systematized narrative starting with the creation of the world to its final destruction. This system grew out of Gondwanan mythology and carries several key developments. All right? So by this time, the high god has faded away and it's been replaced by a primordial pair, Father Sky and Mother Earth. And there's an interesting development in a distinction and opposition between good and evil. Witzel dates this system to some 40,000 years ago and speculates that it originated somewhere in Southwest Asia and then spread into Europe and the Americas. Okay, so how can we date these mythologies so far back? The answer stems from Witzel's main premise that the parallels between mythologies are due to a common origin in the distant past. By using data from other fields, we can establish certain absolute dates just how far back this originating point goes. The best case for a distant dating is based on comparing Eurasian with South American mythologies because their striking parallels undeniably point to a common origin and because the Bering Land Bridge serves as an absolute point of dating. This landmass, which connected Siberia to Alaska, facilitated human migration into the Americas. And because we can date the disappearance of this land bridge to approximately 11,000 years ago, we can also say with certainty that Laurasian mythology must be at least 11,000 years old. So let's get into the meat of the matter and look at several Laurasian motifs, starting with the beginning of creation. And here's one you may be familiar with. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, 
and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. These are the first two verses of Genesis. In the beginning it paints of primordial waters, and wrapped in darkness is a very ancient one. Consider another example of this from Hinduism. This is from the Rig Veda, which is Hinduism's oldest scripture. It's dated back to 1500 BC or even older. And here's what it has to say about the beginning. Quote, There was neither death nor immortality then, nor was there a mark of day and night. It breathed, windless, by its own determination, this one. Beyond this, there was nothing at all. Darkness was hidden by darkness in the beginning. A featureless, salty ocean was all this universe. A germ, covered by emptiness, was born through the power of heat as the one. So interesting that right there, right, we see Hinduism and the biblical narrative, we have the ocean and wrapped in darkness, right? But you can say that geographically there's a possibility of diffusion. But now let's look into the Maya of South America and we're going to use the Popol Voy, which is the book of the community. This is uh, originally was the oral tradition that was narrated amongst the Kincha people who were a Mayan people. And in the 16th century, it was codified into writing. So this is what the Mayan myth of the Kincha states the beginning was like, quote, these then are the first words, the first speech. There is not yet one person, one animal, bird, fish, crab, tree, rock, hollow, canyon, meadow, or forest. All alone the sky exists. The face of the earth has not yet appeared. Alone lies the expanse of the sea, along with the womb of all the sky. There is not yet anything gathered together all is at rest, nothing stirs, all is languid, at rest in the sky. There is not yet anything standing erect, only the expanse of the water, only the tranquil sea lies alone. There is not yet anything that might exist, all lies placid and silent in the darkness in the night. Wow. Wow. Right? So you can see that we have really striking similarities right of all the elements they could have chosen they could have chosen the earth wind fire the beginning is a primordial ocean a water featureless has no earth no no nothing just enwrapped in darkness and from this point everything emerges right so as we move on to the next motif after the further development of the earth there is then the separation of heaven and earth. And this forms the second major motif, which is the primordial pair. Remember that in Gondwanan mythology, they have a high god, but Laurasian mythology rather has a primordial pair. And in India, you have Deus Pita, which is sky father, and Prithivi Mata, or mother earth. So the primordial pair is typically Father Sky and Mother Earth. And you see this virtually everywhere. So we know, for example, in Greek, along the same lines with Roman mythologies, you have Uranus, who is the sky god, and you have Gaia, Mother Earth. But the same primordial pair is retained in the mind myth. So in the Popovoi, creation is participated by the divine pair Zumu Cain and Ixpiakak. Now Zumu Cain is a female divinity. She is the creator of the green earth. And Ixpiakak is a male divinity. He's the creator of the blue sky. Now notice that there's a multiple parallel here. It's not simply that there is a pair, but the genders are retained with their association. So the male god is the sky god, whereas the female god is the earth goddess. So even the gender role, so to speak, has been retained 
as this myth has been carried out. Now, this primordial pair would then generate numerous gods, and the other titles for Zumukain and Ixpiakak are she who has born children and he who has begotten many sons. So this concept of the primordial pair, Father Sky, Mother Earth, then giving birth to many generations of gods, typically it's three or four, is again very widespread. Among the Hindus, you have the Devas versus the Asuras. The Greeks have the Olympian versus the Titan gods. And in Germanic mythology, we have the Acer versus the Vanir. Likewise, in Mayan mythology, we have the, seven, the sons of the seven Makkah versus the twins, Hunuapu and Zubalank, okay, who are the grandchildren of Father Sky and Mother Earth. Now, this is very interesting because Laurasian mythology um, seems to emphasize a duality between good and evil that is manifested in these divine intergenerational battles, right? One set of deities tends to be more evil, the other tends to be good, and there is this strife that occurs. Again, motif that is retained in wide areas of the earth. Now the last motif we're going to look at is the global flood. And this is a very archaic myth. Um, it's not just in Laurasian mythology, it actually predates Laurasian mythology. Witzel dates it as far back as Pangaean, so we're talking possibly a hundred thousand years ago or more. Um, there's been a lot of speculation recently from people like Graham Hancock that perhaps um, the melting ice waters caused by a great cataclysm some 11 or 12,000 years ago might have given um, uh, influence to have created these myths. But the reality is that the global flood is so ancient, it cannot be accounted for a cataclysm that occurred some 12,000 years ago. Okay, it simply predates it. But again, to find the motif, we'll go back to India. We'll start with the Satan, Satapatha Brahmana, which is dated to 300 BC. There is a story of Manu. He's almost like a Noah type figure, uh, wherein on a particular day, a fish appears to him and warns him that in such and such a year, there will come a great flood and that he needs to prepare by creating a ship because when the flood comes, it would simply wipe out everything and everyone. And so he does so. So this is somewhat more in line with the Noah myth and the Gilgamesh myth. Now, whether the original global flood myth contained a ship might be debatable, but what is certainly true is that the concept of a flood that engulfed virtually the entire earth is what is widespread. That is the motif that has been covered um, virtually in all parts of humanity. Okay, So the Popovoy speaks of several creations of humanity. Okay, And the one that preceded us was the humanity that was created from carved wood. Uh, this was a population of beings that spread all over the earth but because they could not give the gods the respect that they were owed, nor could they remember the gods the way that they wanted to be remembered, they were destroyed by a great cataclysm, a great flood. And the Popovoy has a commentary, and in the commentary it says, quote, the destruction of the earth by flood prior to our present age was a widespread tradition in Mesoamerica. There was among them information of the flood and of the end of the world, and they called it butik, which is the word which means flood of many waters and means judgment. And so they believe that another butik is about to come, which is another flood and judgment, not of water, but of fire, which they say would be the end of the world. So this myth, again, widespread. And we can also look at the Dresden Codex. This is um, a depiction of uh, an old goddess, Chak Chak Chel, who is pouring out destructive waters that she carries in a jar, while a black painted god holds his weapon 
over the surface of the earth while wielding a long staff. And you can see streams of water descending from the jaws of a pluvial caiman and from a pair of eclipse glyphs that it carries below its body. I just went over a very small piece of the evidence that Witzel goes over in his book. But I think you can see that just looking at the similarities among individual myths, as well as the, over as well as the overall structure among mythologies across you know, vast distances of the earth, that it must point to a distant common ancestor for these mythologies. All right, now Witzel wrote a 600 page book, 400 pages of dense information, and then 200 pages of notes. I would highly recommend uh, you read this if you wanna get into more detail. Um, but in this video, I can really only look at these, you know, select few myths. And we're just looking at a comparison of Eurasian and South American mythologies. Again, hopefully to convince you that there's definitely something to this. Now, overall, um, Witzel goes over many more motifs, uh, just to briefly look at them here. So again, we went over the primordial waters, uh, the second part, the primordial egg or the primordial giant. So where does everything come from uh, on the earth? Um, there's some myths that talk of a primordial egg that's cracked, which originates everything. And then there's also a primordial giant often that is uh, ritualistically killed and then his body parts form different parts of the earth so maybe his skull forms the mountain ribs form trees feet form land etc yeah. um, the primordial hill or island so after the earth is created land is created it's still floating around the earth and it has uh, excuse me floating around the waters and it has to be stabilized so there are some Laurasian myths that deal with this. We went over Father Heaven, Mother Earth, and their children, the four generations. Um, a common motif is that heaven is pushed up. So in Greek mythology, you have Atlas holding the dome of the sky. In India, you have Indra supporting the dome of the sky. Um, the current gods defeat or kill their predecessors. We discussed that. The killing of a dragon, um, very common motif. Witzel goes over uh, comparing Japan, Greek, and Mayan myth that deals with this. Uh, the first humans and their first evil deeds, origin of death and the flood. Yeah, so, um, you know, concept of an original sin or a fall from grace is very archaic. It's not limited to the Bible. Um, it exists in many different cultures and civilizations. Uh, then there is um, an age of heroes and nymphs. There is um, deities or gods that teach humans different things, teach them fire, food, give them culture. Um, the spread of humans, emergence of local nobility. Right, so then you have common history. Um, and then finally you have a destruction. Right, the destruction of the world. And we sort of touched a little bit about that when we were going over the global myth in Mesoamerica, the concept of Butik in the Mayan culture about a final judgment. So yeah, the final judgment is um, the conclusion to the Laurasian mythology. So the key here is that Laurasian mythology focuses on origins. Uh, it seems to be a reflection on human life itself from birth, strife, and then final death. Um, it deals with the questions of where we come from and where we are going. Now, this is very different from Gondwanan mythology, which is much older. And, you know, Witzel doesn't go into too much into Gondwanan mythology other than to use it as a counter check. But some of the points and elements that he identifies for Gondwanan or that number one, heaven and earth already exist. So these are pre-existent. Um, there are no myths generally that deal with the formation of the earth. There is the concept of a high god. So remember, Laurasian has a primordial pair, yet Gondwanan retains the concept of a high god. But again, this high god is more of a deus odiosus, which is an idol god. 
He's not very uh, intertwined or involved in human existence. He's sort of just there, all right? Humans mostly interact with the sons or the lesser deities of this high god. These are the tricksters, the demiurges. They educate and culture mankind. There's a concept of a golden age or a primordial period that is ended by some kind of evil deed, uh, a mistake or a breaking of a taboo. It could have been caused by uh, a deity or sometimes humans. So again, the concept of almost this loss of grace, this fall, is very ancient. Human creation from a tree, clay, or rock. Now, interesting, right? Creation from clay. This is, uh, this is retained in the Bible. And it's one of the aspects I'm going to look into is the fact that the Bible does seem to retain certain uh, more archaic elements. Uh, certain Gadwan and elements that are in the storyline. But again, the creation from these three elements is very ancient. And then humans act haughtily or make a mistake, and then there's a punishment from a flood. So again, the flood is not simply Laurasian, it is much older. It is Gadwanan and honestly probably goes back to even before humans um, exited out of Africa. And then lastly, Witzel notes that there is no uh, end of the world, okay? So the concept of a final destruction is simply not mentioned in, in Gadwanan mythology. So in sum, the similarities among the mythologies of the world point to a common origin, a single underlying mythological system known as Laurasian mythology that originated some 40,000 years ago and then spread over several continents.